Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, for your attention and your interest in Shakespeare's sonnets and Dickinson and um, a wonderful 21st century poet I'll be talking about also, Evie Shockley. So this session, this conversation, as you know, is called Partners in Time, Shakespeare, Dickinson, and Beyond. And my talk more specifically is called Generative Reading, Shakespeare, Dickinson, Shockley. I want to thank Parikh and Adeline especially um, for giving me this opportunity. And I'm actually quite excited about some of the ways this talk um, and the more extensive work behind it might dance a bit with Adeline's talk today and and also always with Parikh's work. And I, I quite agree with Adeline that Parikh's book on Dickinson Shakespeare was um, extremely, is extremely valuable. Um, now this is a live talk, as you guys know, so that makes it a little bit more suspenseful, of course, which is maybe a good thing for a post-lunch hour. Do you think it keeps people a little bit awake? And it will be a little bit more of an involved talk too, instead of one that I'm just reading, because I'm going to share with you some experiments and comparative reading um, that helps to illuminate um, the question of Dickinson and Shakespeare sonnets. Now we know Dickinson had a lifelong love of Shakespeare. Our whole conference is, is, is emphasizing that, but I do argue that she was not an uncritical bardolator, as, as many of you also argue, as Parikh you point out with, with her burlesque and so forth. But I imagine a little shake of her head when she read Emerson declaring in Representative Men that Shakespeare's mind is the horizon beyond which at present we do not see. No matter that Shakespeare was widely believed the greatest poet of the time, practically considered a prophet or a god, the idea that anyone's mind was a horizon be beyond which she did not see or beyond which she did not think contradicted the very modus operandi of her work. Her poems existed as products of reading and thinking beyond seeming horizons. So in most of the talk, I will try to illuminate a bit with this comparative reading and some experimental play, Dickinson's intimacy with and her critical creative reading of Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, and with a particular emphasis on sonnets that imagine and proactively engage future readers. I suggest that Dickinson distills, as I've demonstrated before, the distilling, but also adapts critiques and experiments with these sonnets and thus crafts her own ways to engage readers in later centuries. Now, reading Dickinson as a critical and creative reader of Shakespeare with a focus on reader engagement is particularly interesting when we consider how 20th and 21st century women poets of color might critically and creatively read Dickinson. A Dickinson who is no longer a disenfranchised, mostly unpublished nobody as she was when she read and experimented with Shakespeare, but a poet with something of the stature that Shakespeare had in 19th century America. Now, in her vital essay, I'm going to move on here to this next slide. In her vital essay, Coloring Dickinson, Race, Influence, and Lyric Disreading, poet and scholar Evie Shockley cites Dickinson's enshrinement as the foremother of American women's poetry and examines the possibility of poets of color strategically reading that form other in a process, she says, that neither excuses the racism or silence on race in her poems, nor sidelines these readers' racial subjectivity, but enables them to choose Dickinson as an influence in a meaningful way on their own terms. In the last part of my talk, I begin to look at 
Shockley's own powerful innovations with techniques of reader engagement. Innovations that I imagine would fascinate the riddling, questioning, engaging Dickinson and possibly press her to think and think again what all the truth told slant but told might look like. Now, this work is part of a broader project that integrates insights from cognitive poetics, cognitive philosophy, behavioral psychology, and the science of reading to address questions of literary transmission and canon formation and to explore the natures of lyric. I taught two years ago a seminar that you just see the little heading of also with two images, the eye and the eye, which is a favored pun of Shakespeare and one that I think Dickinson's also very aware of and that I'll use these little symbols um, as my talk unfolds. But I introduce them, I introduce them here. In this particular seminar and really relevant to this, to this work that I do is, is the sense that long before psychology, and neuroscience were even fields of study. Poets were the ones who experimented with language and cognition and discovered ways to engage attention, influence perception, provoke and test ideas, amplify memory, and collaborate with minds far from their own in space and time. Um, I just have a few names here. I was going to judge what kind of time and what kind of um, technical difficulties I might have had and then decide how much to elaborate on this theoretical framework. And I'm pretty much deciding not to elaborate on it for now, but this is a slide anyone can come back to and I'm really happy to talk about too. I will just mention that Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, in which he really gives a kind of encyclopedic um, thorough, like career-long examination of the work he's done, exposing, um, making vivid the the very natural, the human um, kinds of cognitive heuristics and cognitive biases that we all live with, that are part of being human. That many of these, including the halo effect, the heuristic that's called what you see is all there is. He actually has an acronym for that because it's so common. Um, and also this tendency to, to grant a bit of authority to whatever is familiar, all have really profound implications for canon formation. And I've been thinking about them a lot as I think about what it is I'm doing working with Dickinson and Shakespeare um, and very much trying to, to decolonize a lot of my classes and then looking at 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 um, Dickinson's future readers in a really wide way. So, okay, so that was, I guess, a little more elaboration than I might have intended. Here is the Shakespeare frontispiece um, to volume seven of the Dickinson family copy of Knight's Shakespeare, which Anne, I know, is going to talk a lot more about. It's a curious thing to look at, um, these frontispieces to the sections on the poem and the section on the sonnets. And I'll refer back to them a little later when, when we look at, when we examine some of the reasons why maybe Dickinson didn't write sonnets per se. Now we know about Dickinson's immersion and love for the, for the plays. We have less direct evidence of her engagement in the sonnets, but as many of you I think have also felt, how could she not be greatly curious and deeply analytical with the lyric poems of the bard, especially with their, with themes that were also central to her work. Notably, she does not write sonnets, as I said, but a close relation um, to sonnets, as well as in her, in her quatrained tendency and in, in various 
versions of her lyric. There are key differences, but some really interesting similarities as well. I, I Two years ago, you might remember, this is just a little overview of what is so compellingly similar in three dimensions to these two poets. Today, it's a useful overview, but today we're going to focus on this last category especially. And I'm going to give you two new words besides performative, dramatic, philosophical, richly oral, two new kind of helpful words that categorize a lot of what we find in both Dickinson and Shakespeare and a lot of what makes them so engaging for readers. So the two key words are gappiness and stickability. Um, gappiness is, is, a, is um, coined by Emma Smith, the Shakespeare scholar who has just come out with a terrific new book, This is Shakespeare. And if she had to sort of say what one word finally could explain Shakespeare's great fame and, and long run um, at the top of the canonical list, she would say gappiness. And she explains right here, um, how whenever you are faced with gaps and you do work to fill them in, then you have made your your active involvement in that meaning making can make it all the more all the more believable to you. Um, it also enables every age to to suit Shakespeare, um, who does not have all kinds of topographical references, all sorts of proper names, the latest things happening in London politics that you will find in Ben Jonson and other contemporary playwrights. But in Shakespeare, instead, you have that adapts to many other um, time periods. And so in Emma Smith's new book, what she does is, is go through each century and how the plays and poems um, were reframed and read in such different ways. Back to stickability. Stickability, um, I'm, I'm making that word um, based on the adjective stickable that 19th century actor Edmund Keane used to describe how Shakespeare's lines were just so easy to memorize compared to other stuff that he had to memorize. I also find, um, my students find that this is also true. And there's a lot of reasons for this that have to do with sound weaving and rhyme and um, other things that we'll get into. But if you keep in mind that to succeed, of course, his verse, had to engage a wide range of people, uh, illiterate as well as literate, had to stick in the minds of players, learning hundreds of lines and multiple parts at once. He cultivated a kind of line that would be just as stickable as possible. Now on this note of stickability, I would like to emphasize that poems are choreography. Um, they are choreography for the lips, the tongue, the soft palate. They dance, the lips, tongue, soft palate. We dance when we speak a poem. And I don't know if you also do this, um, but I've become really conscious, and it may be because I have a little bit of a dance background, nothing like Adeline, but a little bit, really conscious of what my lips and my tongue and the rest of my mouth is doing when I pronounce different. You're actually, it's as if you've got this, this gymnastics floor routine or this dance where you're actually bringing your lips back into certain places if there's lots of rhyme and sound weaving. So if you just say aloud, um, just say aloud, why don't you just read aloud these lines and especially maybe notice the ones that I've done these colors with. So we'll re read them aloud. You can you can unmute if you like or stay muted, but, but move your mouth. I cannot dance upon my toes. No man instructed me. 
but oftentimes among my mind, a glee possesseth, possesseth me that I had ballet knowledge would put itself abroad in pirouette to blanch a troop or lay a prima mad. So one of the things I notice happening in a lot of these richly sound woven Dickinson lines is something I call sound chiasmus, where she actually does, she does this in so many lines, you get a, a consonant sound like the, you know, chiasmus uh, in terms of semantic chiasmus or the words repeating inward and then outward. Well, the same thing happens here with sound. Um, and so the same thing is happening with the way your lips and your tongue are actually acting out, dancing out this particular kind of sound. Here's one from Shakespeare, which erst from heat did canopy the herd. You have the er, e, e, er. And of course there's rafter of satin and roof of stone. World scoop their arcs and firmament row. That is both visually and physically and orally a chiasmus um, where you actually have the, the, the sounds lining up in this opposite way to the center and then out they go again. World scoop their arcs and firmament row. I find this stuff really kind of stunning. <laughs> I don't know about you. Um, I don't have too many more of these slides. The steeple swam in amethyst, of course. If you're really nervous about something, just say that line 10 times in a row. It's a good one. And here's something else I do sometimes. The, this is a quatrain from a Shakespeare sonnet. And by spelling words, sometimes phonetically, which they are not in English, as we know, but actually spelling them phonetically, you sometimes will see and notice more sound weaving, more threads, more colors that are weaving together a stanza. So this one you might enjoy saying aloud also. Those hours that with gentle work did frame the lovely gaze where every eye doth dwell will play the tyrants to the very same and that unfair which fairly doth excel. That was a sonnet that I, that as Elizabeth Petrino just kindly remembered, I talked about as one that Dickinson indeed took a hold of and distilled, enacted a complete distillation of this sonnet that thematizes distillation. And the result was her poem, Essential Oils Are Wrong, ending like Shakespeare's does uh, with, well, like many of Shakespeare's sonnets do with a deictic this, with the word this, um, which works as a kind of fulcrum or a kind of, a kind of hinge that can swing from the past to the speaking present the this that the writer writes and the writer speaks being the poem is in some sense the this then that in the present moment of reading the poem one encounters it's a big part of gappiness actually to have a lot of deictic language a lot of pronouns as adeline talked about that i also um the ways that it is 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 a shape shifter um gappiness and and they go together an experiment now and a question for you what do you think of these first 10 lines of a shakespeare sonnet and what do you hear i'm going to just start reading it and see if it's familiar to you when I have seen the sun begin his tour of worlds from his unknown amazing house and leave a day at every quiet door and leave a deed in every place he goes and do these feet sons incident of fame and do all this sons accident of noise, kissing with golden face the meadows tame, gilding wild places with a liquid joy. Then has the earth of men seemed but a drum 
and men themselves but boys at bootless play. So I wonder um, if it sounds familiar to anybody. It's you can write it in the chat. I can't really see hands, but because it's not a Shakespeare sonnet, but what I did is I just Shakespeareized a a Dickinson poem. I just made pentameter lines out of what are her ballad measure lines. And so if you want to look at the two of them next to each other, um, I found it a useful thing to do because I was testing out a, a lot. It, it's, it's a kind of experiment. I did it with a bunch of poems. A useful thing to do because you find embedded in many of these short Dickinson poems a really similar kind of a structure, one that sets up the representation of an episode of thought. When I have seen, then this. When that, then this. There's a bunch of the sonnets that do that. And now Dickinson herself does this in, in a much more concise way, but you can see she actually says everything one might need to or want to about such an experience and such a reflection without quite needing the whole, what now seems like a kind of oops, a kind of heavy and lofty um, substance of the sonnet. So that's just a little experiment. Here are just a few other ways that we find Dickinson and Shakespeare playing very similar rhetorical games to engage their readers, both of them, questions. What is your substance? Whereof are you made? Who will believe my verse in time to come? There you see a soul at the white heat. I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? These are actually not proofed against the manuscripts, and so nobody should should quote from these. These were just all in my head when I was making these lists, and I didn't have time to go back. The first two, of course, are Shakespeare, and then the compelling first-person storytellers. When my love swears she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies, or because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me really compelling first-person storytellers. And then there are the bold apostrophes to great powers, sometimes cutting them down to human size, to interlocutors, and ones that must answer to the speakers. So we have devouring time, blunt thou the lion's paws, and make the earth devour her own sweet brood, and do all this other stuff, but I forbid thee one most heinous crime. That's a Shakespeare sonnet. Compared to burglar, banker, father, I am poor once more. And then the intimate address. Wow, I wonder if, if, no, that'll probably get a little messy. All right, I, I know I don't have time to read these full poems, but what I'm showing you here are three sonnets that seem to be part of the root work or resonate with this very intimate poem of request, insecurity, um, manipulation, possibly. Um, you love me, you are sure. I shall not fear mistake. I shall not cheated wake some grinning morn to find the sunrise left and orchards unbereft and dolly gone. I need not start, you're sure, that night will never be. When frightened, home to thee I run to find the windows dark and no more dolly mark, quite none. We have the Shakespeare sonnet, against that time, and I'll just read the quatrain that really seems to resonate. Against that time when thou shalt strangely pass and scarcely greet me with that sun, thine eye, when love converted from the thing it was shall reasons find of settled gravity. And in the Shakespeare sonnet, farewell thou art too dear for my possessing, 
also a resonance with I shall not cheated wake. Thus have I had thee as a dream doth flatter, and sleep a king, but waking no such matter. And then also this, this agonizing sonnet, then hate me when thou wilt, if ever now, agonizing or manipulative or just very human um, sonnet also resonates with the end of, of the Dickinson poem. Be sure you're sure you know. I'll bear it better now, if you'll just tell me so, than when a little dull balm grown over this pain of mine, you sting again. And in the Shakespeare sonnet, if thou will leave me, do not leave me last when other petty griefs have done their spite, but in the onset come, so shall I taste at first the very worst of fortune's might, and other strains of woe, which now seem woe, compared with loss of thee, will not seem so. Also, happier resonances in the intimate addresses. Tis little I could care for pearls who own the ample sea, or brooches, when the emperor with rubies pelteth me, or gold, who am the prince of mines or diamonds, when have I a diadem to fit a dome continual upon me? For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. And then this undermining of social hierarchy and sometimes even an undermining of anthropocentrism. Um, Hamlet, this is, gets out of the sonnets, though there's plenty in the sonnets too about worms and decay. I mean, the ultimate is, is when Claudius asks Hamlet where Polonius is and Hamlet says that he's at supper. And Claudius knows Polonius has been murdered and, and says at supper where and and hamlet says no not at a supper where he dines but at a supper where he is eaten even now by a convocation of worms and thus it is i'm not quoting exactly right and thus it is how how a beggar might make a progress through no how a king might make a progress like a kingly progress through the guts of a beggar because of these worms but here we just have um, a moment, a, an, a, an acknowledgement of, of human, of human hubris. People who vaunt in their youthful sap, maybe all of us, and then it just this this powerful caesura at height decrease, all in one line, and where their brave state out of memory, and in the bronze and blaze poem. Um, the speaker becomes infected with taints of majesty till I take vaster attitudes and strut upon my stem, disdaining men in oxygen for arrogance of them, but ends with the acknowledgement that, that her splendors are but menagerie and she will sometime be long ago an island in dishonored grass whom none but daisies know. Um, that's what one of the sonnets looks like in the night version. And I actually won't read this one for the sake of time, but we'll just go to this one. Um, we're going to just look at this one sonnet that really thematizes immortality and the power of poetry to outlast the space time of its author and live again in future space time. This, you would think this theme, which we see over and over in the sonnets, a good 10 or so poems definitely thematize this power of the poem with varying degrees of, of confidence. But this is a theme that is also preoccupying Dickinson. And 
so I was just really curious to see what she what she does. How does where does she do this thing that in Elizabethan literature is called the eternizing conceit or the eternizing project, where you have the claim at the end, like in Sonnet eighteen, so long so long as men can breathe and eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee, that sort of a claim. So here in, well, let's see, I think I have to, you know, I'm using my full screen and I have to confess, can somebody show me with their fingers how many minutes I have left? Or Park, you could just tell me. Um, I, I think it is, but you, you've got, you've got, it depends, it depends on how long you'd like to go on talking, but I think as long as we finish this session by, um, is it, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, it's going to be eight o'clock for me, so I'm assuming it's three o'clock for you. Okay, so, so I have like 10 more minutes. If, yeah, I'd say if you, 10 more minutes and then we can open up for questions and-, and Okay. Because I'm giving you so uh, so this this so I'll do this next part will be a little bit of a tour without full reading of these poems, but I do want it. I did want to put put these together to show you that you can take a famous sonnet like this: "Not marble nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme, but you shall shine more bright in these contents than unswept stone besmeared with sluttish time." When wasteful wars shall statues overturn, and broils root out the work of masonry, nor mars his sword, nor war's quick fire shall burn the living record of your memory. Gainst death and all oblivious enmity shall you pace forth, your praise shall still find room, even in the eyes of all posterity, that wear this world out to the ending doom. So till the judgment that yourself arise, you live in this and dwell in lovers' eyes. Um, and, and eyes always is sort of the, the, the one who says I, the subjectivity, as well as the eyes that do the reading. Um, for so many reasons, it seems this would be a poem that interested Dickinson. Could she have written a poem that basically said this? And if she did, would it look like this? Not marble nor proud monuments of princes will outlive these lines. You'll shine more bright than stone, besmeared with time. So I went on, I, I, I turned this into something of a, of a Dickinsonian Shakespeare, not it was Dickinsonian poem based on the Shakespeare sonnet. What struck me as interestingly, especially weird was the end. Um, so till the judgment you arise, you live in this and dwell in lovers' eyes. She doesn't make that kind of claim about a beloved other in that sort of explicit and and rhetorically fancy kind of, it's very age of patronage, it's very Renaissance way. But when I tried the experiment again and I had her say that wear this world out to the edge of doom, so till the judgment I arise, I live in this and dwell in readers' eyes. I thought, oh, that doesn't sound so much so unlike Dickinson. In fact, it reminded me so much of because I could not stop for death. And so I offer a few branchings out from Sonnet 55, a suggestion that there's something of that spirit in in one in her posthumous in the poems that have the posthumous voice which i know there were also many influences short stories of the period use the posthumous voice um, but it but it also is a way to accomplish the eternizing um, in a more honest way this eternizing theme that she reads over and over again in shakespeare's sonnets and then she also does make the very kind of argument that Shakespeare makes in those sonnets, but in her concise and really, um, really vivid and what is a, it's a sort of modernized way. So if we had lots of time, we would parse 
the poet's light but lamps and perhaps even more interesting to me in connection to the sonnet i showed you is some work for immortality but that's something that's i'm showing you the menu of possibilities for the close comparison and then there's also the importance of the non-idealizing of this eternizing of the poem um, Shakespeare always catches himself when he starts talking about eternity and comes back to anatomy. He says that he, he, he remembers that he's talking about eyes and lips and breath and brains sometimes even. And so here you have Dickinson also um, making, <laughs> using the posthumous voice, this kind of claim, but then adding this daring until the moss had reached our lips and covered up our names. And then they dropped like flakes um, has struck me as presenting an image of this, of almost like a Shakespeare sonnet, an eternizing themed poem with God as the poet and the repealless list as his poem, and it's a poem of faces, a list of faces, um, a kind of ultimate consolation, and a fascinating poem too with this, with this putting the word face where you might expect the word name, especially in the neuroscience of reading, you, you learn that there's overlapping parts of the brain that work on facial recognition and on word recognition. And then also what was the love poem part of that Shakespeare sonnet that comes up and this just came up in one of the earlier sessions that comes up in the fabulous sister poem. So I'll just jump now to say that all of these things that I have talked about, about Shakespeare and Dickinson are so incredibly true about this terrific 21st century poet, Evie Shockley. Um, the historical conditions, the fact that she is a black poet um, living still in a country in which in some ways the civil war has not ever ended all of the particular struggles. Um, I was reading Evie Shockley while I was also reading Isabel Wilkerson's um, terrific book, Cast. Um, and yeah, so so she grapples with so many, so many things powerfully immediately. Um, and she also is an extremely well-read poet. Um, like Shakespeare and Dickinson has absorbed so many discourses and also a whole world of music. She grew up in Nashville and she's an extremely musical poem to, poet too. In her essay, she talks about this choosing to have Dickinson as an influence. She doesn't talk about her own poetry, but I read her own poetry with great interest in, in this vein and then looked at some of the Dickinson poems. This one, I think maybe, maybe not so much, but this, what, what strikes me about this one, as Park has mentioned too, um, is just the cutting down to size of, of, of Shakespeare, the recognition that your life, that, that, this, that this looming um, canonical figure finally is not greater than, than your, your own life. But two poems especially that made me feel had a sort of bridge to Shockley's work. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Though I changed it just a little bit to infirm default and the truth's most grim surprise and the truth must gut punch gradually or every man be blind because there's other kinds of truths that this kind that this poem can be talking about or in the mind of a reader who is trying to get um, the best out of out of Dickinson. And then, of course, much madness is divinest sense to a discerning eye, much sense the starkest madness. So on those notes, remembering tell all at slant and 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 
much since the starkest madness. Just a little look at the table of contents of the Topsy suite. So Evie Shockley rescues, as she puts it, Topsy from Uncle Tom's cabin and gives her a voice. Um, in one of the poems, um, here's her voice. Here's telling the truth slant. And in another, which I'll choose to read out of these two, um, Topsy in this adventure has run into the mistress of the big house. I'm sure I'll take you with pleasure, the mistress said. 200 hours a week and freedom every other day. Topsy laughed nervously. I don't want you to take me. I want my freedom today. You can't have it just because you want it, the mistress said. The rule is freedom tomorrow and freedom yesterday, but never freedom today. Topsy objected. You gotta come sometime to freedom now. So this on the, the much madness and tell all the truth, but tell it slant. And then this poem, um, it's as if she is demonstrating the ultimate way to tell all the truth, but tell it slant, really to tell all the truth. And don't know if I have time to read it. Um, have you read it before anybody? I think I'm going to um, to let you read it yourselves as you're doing. and I can make all these slides available. Then of course, there's the alternate words in Dickinson, um, just an example of, of those fair fictitious people, a poem with many alternates. And this Shockley poem, What's Not to Liken. And you can get the idea of it. I know that I'm going over time. Um, so I'm not reading the whole thing, but I'll read the end. The black girl was pinned to the ground like A, an amateur wrestler in a professional fight. B, swimming in a private pool is a threat to national security. The girl's cry sounded like A, the shrieks of children on a playground. B, the shrieks of children being torn from their mothers. The protesting girl was shackled like A, a criminal. B a runaway slave, liken it or not. Shockley also writes sonnets um, and is an extremely musical poet. Um, so I just end with this image of one of her sonnets um, and it's exuberant ending. Um, a beautiful sonnet based on listening to Abdullah Ibrahim's concert at Carnegie Hall in, in 2014. Um, the beauty eludes, beauty eludes me. Usually I soak up the lush red violet indigo blooms. Abdullah Ibrahim's cool fingers pluck from the keyboard's bed, but bring to these rooms. Stands as forged from replayed past as today's not news, no solacing bouquets. My weeds, I conjure rough green to explode from seeds so furious they bleed or grieving raise crabgrass and blue notes peppered with rust where he grows flowers. Yes, I tend my plants incisively, no phrase that droops or wants out of the sun survives long, but the rest Run wild, flush vivid, throw shade, deluge fruit, lavishly express their dissonant root. So I think that that is, is a good note to end on. And it struck me that, she's, that, she's, that she brought to these rooms, her stanzas, her sonnets, um, something that both Shakespeare and, and Dickinson, a metaphor that they have both used, um, and gives you a little sense also of the range of her work. Um, 
Thanks so much for listening. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. Thank you. I'm sorry that I just went on so long. You can see I've been working on, I have just an abundance of, of work here. Elizabeth, that that was wonderful. That was so that was so rich. There was so many ideas. So so the idea was that Adeline and I would would respond. So I'm going to very very briefly respond, and then maybe Adeline would like to briefly respond. But I'd like to open up to questions because I think there are going to be lots of people. The thing that I'm going to respond about is the thing that I I know the most about, or, or the thing that struck me the most was the posthumous voice that you mentioned, and I think that. Was inspiring and I'd never never thought about that before the way you trace um, Shakespeare's attempt to um, turn the, the fair use to make him immortal and, and, and you mentioned the idea of patronage and it was tied up with that and, and then that idea I think that you, you brought out was that Dickinson does it but through that posthumous voice and I think that that you really do need to publish this, Elizabeth. I mean, send it to the Emily Dickinson Journal or somewhere else. But that was brilliant. I'd never, ever thought about that before. How Shakespeare, how she takes Shakespeare's constant or, or often references to that, that eternalizing of a, of, of a patron or the fair use or the dark lady or whatever. And then where does it go with Dickinson? And you're right. She did. But yes, it's the posthumous voice. So so that, that would be my response. Um, so, so thank you very much. I'm going to turn to Adeline and, and, and maybe she has another response and then let's open it up to, to other people. But, but you didn't, you, you, didn't uh, you, you presented a rich, amazing paper. So, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Elizabeth. It was, it was wonderful. And um, uh, my response very unsurprisingly would be about now what you said about dance. <laughs> um, <laughs> and especially, about the the form of lyric choreography that Dickinson um, really shapes in her poems, and I'm I'm particularly interested in the silence. Um, do I have time for it to show two very very short clips to illustrate what I mean? Um, because she she actually saw ballet being danced on stage. Uh, she saw the Pas de Fleur, Pas de Fleur, which is no longer danced. It's, it was part of La Bayadère. Um, and usually what happens in, in, in romantic ballet is that before the ballerina or the, the male soloist, but the, the male parts were underdeveloped in, in, the 19th, in the early 19th centuries. So it was all about the ballerina. But before she starts dancing, there's always a very dramatic pause. And so I wanted to show you two excerpts of ballets that were actually danced uh, during this time. Uh, if I can share my screen, let me find it. Um, at, at least I'll, I'll just, maybe I'll just show you one. Um, can you all see it? Yes. Yeah. So this is the beginning uh, of Giselle's variation. It's in act one, it's uh, during the Pas des Vendangeurs. And you'll see what I mean. She, she, it's not pantomime. It's, it's before language, and that's what I was trying to say earlier about uh, the lyric and the silences and the, the not nothing. This is the not nothing of dance. It's not yet dance. It's not pantomime. It's a, a, a sort of breath, you know, before she starts. And this is a very famous. Um, a very, very, very famous variation that actually I learned at school and everybody learns at school. Uh, so I'm just going to show you uh, this this little moment. So she see she's she's preparing to to start her variation, and you'll see what she's doing. It's not pantomime; it's something else. This. Yeah, and then the variation starts, but you see when she does the, it's a preparatory step, um, pas de préparation, as, as we say in ballet language. And so that, that's, that's what I was really interested in, because it's very typical 
of lengthy variations in romantic ballet. And so for me, that's, that's, that really has um, influenced Dickens and I'm sure it has influenced her lyric choreography. So thank you so much for, um, for uh, your talk. I, think, I thought it was really fascinating. I think Cindy's, Mackenzie's got a question um, for you, Elizabeth. Cindy, do you want to unmute? Oh. Hey, can you hear me? Okay, I was uh, plugging in because I realized I was just wearing down to nothing there. <laughs> One little thin bit of juice left. Um, Elizabeth, do you remember meeting me in, at, uh, in Amherst? Absolutely, and we talked about the sonnets and you we were uh, totally. We were on the same wavelength that like you, I realized afterwards I was thinking about it for quite some time and I was thinking that, um, and a lot, you weren't specifically dealing with it today either, but uh, coming very close to it. But I think I got very caught up with tr trying to uh, determine how Dickinson was distilling the, the, the sonnet form, the Shakespearean sonnet form. Mm -hmm. And some of what you're showing um, is pertinent, is relevant to that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because I, I did find it curious that she'd never written a sonnet. And I thought, well, probably she has, but it's hidden, you know, typically. Anyway, one of the things I noticed the examples you used, there's some that I also had. Um, thought about in terms of hearing resonances of, uh, of the meter or, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the words, the sound of the words, the alliteration, the syntactical arrangements, that kind of thing. But one thing I did do uh, that was uh, very tedious, but I went through all the poems to see if there were some that were 14 lines long. And I came across, um, you know, that was sort of one of my first efforts. I thought, well, let's see if there's something that's almost, you know, uh, very obviously kind of imitated. And the one I came to was He Fumbles at Your Soul. Now, interestingly, prior to that, no, maybe it was a little later. Uh, uh, Marianne Noble did a paper on Shakespearean, um, forget now what it was. I think it was uh, references uh, in He Fumbles at Your Soul. So that's even, you know, more so it confirms that it was on her mind, uh, that Shakespeare was on her mind as she works within this form that she has created. Now, in the end, one of the points, and I, I was just going to talk to you about it because I like the way you dealt with the, um, you know, the, the typically Shakespearean uh, couplet, which is to, you know, confirm that what has been written will endure in immortality. And, uh, um, it, you know, that poem ends with when winds take forests in their paws, the universe is still. And, you know, when I first read that many, many, many years ago, uh, I thought, what on earth is she talking about? Like it break, it almost breaks away from the poem in its, you know, it's very ethereal. But anyway, if you, if you look at it, that is kind of her couplet confirming the power of poetry to immortalize what has been said. And I thought, you know, that's another kind of translation of the Shakespearean technique. Only I, I found it 
far less clunky than uh, um, Shakespeare, who, you know, like, if this be error and upon me proved, then no man lived nor no man ever loved. You know, it's almost like a diary, you know what I mean? He used to say uh, little expression, little phrases like that. Anyway, and the other, there was another one, the, the uh, 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 the one that is uh, narcotics cannot still the tooth that nibbles at the soul. What's the, what is the poem that starts that? Uh, uh, this it, world anyway. is not conclusion. That's right, right. This world is not conclusion. Anyway, so that was, the, and one other little source that I had uh, was Lucy Brock Boydo's sonnets. And, and also her book, you know, sort of based on the master letters. And obviously the influence of Dickinson on Brock Boydo uh, is for all the reasons that I found, uh, or the, all the, um, you know, techniques that Dickinson uses in her own poetry of compression um, and, you know, uh, surprise and you know well you know we know what they all are <laughs> I just can't rattle them off right at the moment anyway so that was that was I'm just going to add that yeah wonderful observations wonderful observations we'll have to talk more yeah <laughs> yes I, I'm so glad somebody's writing this because honestly that thing has been baking in my mind for years and I, I, I just, I don't know why, why I couldn't for, forge ahead with it, but um, I guess it's because other things come up and then you start, you know, you start on another line, but I, I've never forgot because I love doing what you did today. And that is going through the poems and finding all these intricate combinations and influences and uh, resonances of, of, uh, of Shakespeare or whatever you're comparing her to. Of course, it works for many different writers. Anyway, thanks for that. It was, I really enjoyed it. Just my kind of thing. <laughs> thanks very much, Cindy. We've got um, three more questions, but then I think maybe we could we could close it so that we could move on to the next, next part. So Juan Carlos, would you like to ask your question to Elizabeth? Yes, thank you. Um, Elizabeth, I was mesmerized by your presentation. Uh, the, the connections between the sonnets and, and Dickinson's poems are oral, thematic, rhetorical, in, in the kind of in metaphoric conception. Uh, they have always fascinated me, which goes more or less in the same direction. Um, I, I would have loved to do the research you have done, the close and, and sensitive readings, but, but I'm glad you did, because what you have shared with us is brilliant. Um, I have a question, and, and I hope it's not very um, uh, naive. Um, what are the difficulties you have encountered proving there is indeed influence? Um, I have had a few of those insights uh, here and there, and I, I have felt uh, a little unsure, never really knowing if I am projecting my love of Shakespeare on my love of Dickinson or vice versa. Um, I was just talking to Eliza about, uh, about that a few days ago. Uh, my question is maybe, uh, how did you manage to investigate this distillment. Um, I'm really inspired by your talk. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juan Carlos. And you asked just such a wonderful question that when I started doing this kind of work um, and with other, other poets, because I've worked for a while in cross-century poetics, I, I thought about it a lot. And, and 
my answer is that it doesn't you don't need to you don't have to prove i mean if you were if you're writing biography then sometimes your goal is um then you may be showing some kind of proof then you may may be getting into into letters and there are maybe things that that are are part of what what you're doing but if what you're trying to do is to show that there seems to be an incredible resonance here that there probably was some kind of influence in one of the many direct indirect myriad ways that the mind works then the then that's what you can do you can show the resonance and it doesn't really matter if if you are proving it for good or for not if you know nobody's going to get into the brain cells of dickinson or shakespeare and really see where the the neural web actually is but what is valuable i think is the way that these poems really illuminate each other's and and even reading evie shockley in, in light of of Dickinson and vice versa. It's the comparative reading can just be a very illuminating and, and rich way to read. And so that becomes more of the goal than than proving that there had to have been a certain influence. Um, M Martinelle has got a question, Elizabeth. And I'm going to keep mine very brief. It's really more of a comment. Um, you might, I put into chat links to readings by Gwendolyn Brooks and Toy oh, Derricotte that you might be interested in. Gwendolyn Brooks, who's, you know, the voice of God, has yeah. Emily Dickinson and I have absolutely nothing. In I know. I know. Yeah, Evie talks about that. Actually, I think I've, I'm going to listen to them again, but I think I have listened to these. Okay, you listen. So, and... Um, Let's see, I think that's it because I wanted to defer to Vivian because she's done a lot of work on poets and Dickinson and, and, and influence. Thank you. So. Okay, so I'm going to be quick and Elizabeth, uh, uh, this was so stimulating. Thank you so much. Okay, in brief, what does Shockley have to say about Shakespeare? Yeah, well, you know, interesting. Um, I have found that in interviews, I'm actually, I can't wait to, to now, to, I, I'm gonna reach out to her. I'm, I, I wanna have some big conversations with her soon. Um, I met her once, and, um, but I, she didn't know I was doing this. Um, I, she wouldn't, it was years ago. Anyway, um, I do know from reading um, and, and just researching her that she mentioned Shakespeare's sonnets. As, as an influence and, and as a work that she returns to again and again. In one interview, I think it was 2011, she gave a beautiful list, just a great list of the reading that she reads over and over again. It was about 15 different works and it was poetry, biography, fiction, covering many kinds of traditions. And Shakespeare sonnets was, was in that list. And I thought, oh, I am not surprised at all. I mean, I could, I could go on and on with these comparative readings because I also found some ma many rich Shakespearean kinds of moments in Shockley. And I actually think that her her ear for different kinds of discourse, different kinds of music, different kinds of lyric um, is, is really tremendous. So she does a lot of remixing in a way that that Shakespeare did from different discourses. Thank you. That's very helpful. Okay, I think we should all thank Elizabeth again for a brilliant paper.